So, uh, got it. So uh, thank you again, and uh, thanks for the invitation to speak to you all at IGPP from Australia. So I'd like to first uh, begin the talk by acknowledging that I'm speaking from the land of Nanawa and Nambri people, and I pay respects to the elders past and present and emerging. And today we're going to talk about uh, Kilauea Summit, which is also a sacred place for native Hawaiians. And this project especially, uh, specifically look at the 2018, eruption that was in the news a lot from the seismic and infrasound point of view. And this project is uh, one of my PhD work we've done with uh, Jong Wen Zan, who's also in the audience today, and with collaborators from different parts of the world, including Quentin Brissot, who's now in Norway, Osamu Sanabada in Japan, and Megan Miller at ANU. So volcanic eruption um, gets, uh, caught many people's attention. Uh, not just because of this sort of dramatic footage with uh, ocean entry, but also the destructiveness that comes with it. So there's a lot of uh, motivation for us to understand how does this eruptive behavior evolve with time? How, how can we understand what drives these erup uh, eruptions? So like for here, the example we show is a La Palma that was in the news a lot recently, but there's another one which is much closer uh, to us. Um, and it's also very well studied just because it's very accessible. So there's Kilauea volcano. Uh, it's the youngest shield volcano in the Hawaiian Emperor Seamount chain. So it's at the southeast corner of the big island. It's a shield volcano. So it has a sort of like two reef zones that flanks southwest and east. And then there's a summit which has a caldera as it collapsed uh, over time. So this Kilauea volcano has been erupted for, for a long time and has been monitored continuously. So prior to 2018, most of the eruption sort of concentrate in the Middle East Rift Zone where Pu'o is, and sort of like have extensive lava flow over 10, 20 years and uh, made some ocean entry as well. But in 2018, the eruption um, started at the Lower East Rift Zone with two multiple fissures begin at the red spot and then eventually sort of focuses to one particular fissure called fissure eight, which uh, has a lot of lava flow and make ocean entry. And this is uh, the live view right now. If you go onto the USGF's website, you can click on the webcam that overlooks the Kilauea summit. We have now a, a new lava lake and a new fissure that it started erupting just a couple of weeks ago. And, um, um, and started to fill up the crater again with lava. And on top of the summit, this summit ha has experienced multiple transformation over time. So we have the fissure that was erupting alongside, there's also a lot of uh, this different behavior at the caldera. So you have 20, 2008 to uh, 2018, it was a crater, mostly crusted over with an open vent has, and has a lava lake. And during the 2018 eruption, the lava lake disappeared and the caldera slowly collapsed and broadened and formed a much larger crater. And sort of the summit quietens down for a couple of months. And within less than a year, in July, 2019, we can see that the, uh, the crater starts to fill back up with water of uh, some chemical composition. And by December, 2020, a new lava lake uh, started to erupt and fill up the lake, fill up the crater with lava. So there's a lot of transformation with this caldera. And the question for us is like, trying to understand how does this caldera and the fissure um, connected? What's the plumbing system? What drives this eruption? So this plumbing system has been long recognized even, even by the native Hawaiians, that they has to be connected. So there's a saying in the, I love this story, that there's a saying in the native Hawaiian traditions that their god, the goddess of fire, Pili, whenever she has to leave her house to go to the coastline, so she will take an underground highway, which is basically the plumbing system. So a lot of the effort in the past decades is trying to characterize this plumbing system and also understand how they 
can erupt. And with that, USGS, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, has invested and committed a lot of different types of instruments to monitor Kilauea. So here I listed the in geophysical instruments that I used in my analysis. So that includes broadband seismometers um, around that volcano and also in other parts of the island. There's also several broadband seismometers at the summit itself with a very good azimuthal coverage. We have a, a few accelerometers. Um, then this is the one that I highlight on the summit. And there are a few infrasound sensors as well. So there's a one just right by the crater and one in a slightly closer distance and one much further away. There are also other geophysical instruments not plotted on this map here, including uh, GPSs and tilt meter data. And we'll take a look of how uh, these data has recorded the 2018 eruption. So first of all, uh, I will show the tilt me, um, the geodetic data and what do they look like during the Kilauea eruption at the summit. So we see that, so there's three panels here. The top panel is tilt. The bottom two panels are GPSs. They are all on the summit. And what we can see that over the three months of eruption, there's a continuous subsidence um, characterized by the downward trend, but then it's punctuated by 62 large 4.7 magnitude seismic events. And these are the events when you have this zigzag motion that's also happening. So these 62 events um, highlighted here, so I sort of uh, separated them into event 1 to 12 or the earlier events and event 13 to 62. And why do I do so is that the seismic data, although recorded all the events as well, but they do not record it in the equal way in the sense that the first 12 events, the summit stations recorded them, but then for the next 50 events, the summit stations clip and become unusable. So the question for us is that for today in this talk, I'll go through like the first question, what does the geophysical measurements already tell us about the magma plumbing system beneath the Kilauea summit? So we'll look at how um, the past data uh, studies with using data prior to the eruption had tells out, tell us about the plumbing system and also data from the current eruption. And then on the sort of the main part of the talk, we'll talk about how can we uh, study this seismic source mechanism that coincides with this rapid zigzag motion for the first 12 events where we have near field data. And what does it mean to have near field data? And then for the remaining 50 events when all the near field data are clipped. So uh, to the first question, so we can identify the summit reservoir by many means. One of the um, means that people have used is using geodetic measurements like INSA, GPS, and TILT to measure the behavior of the reservoir. So there are, the rest, there are two reservoirs at the summit and they tend to have this breathing behavior once in a while. So they call it like a deflation inflation event. And they have, they create a very strong geodetic signal. For so INSA, you can sort of map out where the reservoir is and with different types of model like Morgi model or Penny type crack, you can model the reservoir and try to identify where the depth is considering the trade-off as well. So we have um, with the different groups, uh, they have identified two main reservoirs at the summit. So there's the Hale Mau Mau Reservoir. It's the shallower one at one to, one to two kilometer depth. And it's located slightly northeast of the old crater. And then we have the South Caldera Reservoir which is, uh, as its name, is south of the caldera and is slightly deeper at three to, three to five kilometer depth. Seismically, there's also uh, many groups have used uh, this particular feature called the very long period seismic events to constrain, partic in particular, the Hale Mau Mau Reservoir. So there's work done by Bernard Shaw, Philip Dawson, and here I want to particularly highlight Chao Liang et al's work 
which is published uh, in 2019, and then there's another paper 2020. So what they use is that there's this uh, very long period seismic event. So it's like very long period just because you have this really long period oscillation. And uh, if we sort of measure what is the resonant frequency, it lines up quite nicely for all these events. And these stations are all stations at the summit. And what they identify is that this oscillation is related to how when the reservoir and the lava lake um, interact with each other, it creates oscillation. Without going through too much detail on the physical modeling, what they can use is to use the frequency resonance to identify certain key features about um, how this system connects. So that includes the size of the reservoir, the location, depth of the reservoir, and also magma viscosity, which is important when we are trying to understand how fluid a magma can be and that controls the eruption behavior. So there are many things that we have known about uh, Kilauea. And what I find interesting is that with the 2018, we can also identify that it is indeed the Hale Mama Reservoir that is the main reservoir that is deforming during the eruption. So what I have done here is that we take particular motions from the first 12 events of 1 to 12 um, recorded by the summit stations. And what these stations are recording is that they recorded near field static displacement and they form rectilinear polarization. So they have this really clean polarization and this um, particle motion points back to the source. So we can um, do it for all the events. So they are all marked in red. And we can see that they're all pointing inwards towards the crater. They're not exact, they don't exactly line up to a point though. And that was because the volcano has very complex velocity structures. So sometimes ray path can bend. But what we can do is that we can compare this particle motion with the ones from the previous VLP events examined by Chao Liang et al. And see if they line up. And if they line up, that means they're all pointing back to the same seismic source. And in fact, we find that they do. So these are all the, the black lines. And then the same source, and that would be the Hale Mau Mau Reservoir. And we can also do extend these studies to the accelerometers. So the accelerometers are the um, three triangles around the caldera at three different quadrants. And these accelerometer, uh, accelerometers did not clip uh, during the event, uh, during the eruption. So we could measure the particle motion. So this is for the first 12 events, and they can continue to do so for the rest of the events. And what we find is that this particle motion, so we can measure the from the motion, we measure the back asthma, it tracks a uh, eastward source migration. So there are certain trends is that when you see the particle motion sort of changes pattern, but in overall pattern, so that UWE is located sort of north, west of the caldera and the back azimuth is decreasing. So it's actually rotating towards the east. Same as well for hash, uh, PAUD, which is on the south east corner and it's rotating towards um, east. So, and the HMLE because it's located to the east. So the change in back azimuth is minimal. But overall, they're all moving towards the east. So we can sense that in this eruption, the seismic source, there's a migration in the seismic source. So, and that is from um, seismometer, but from the geodetic measurements, a lot of modeling work has been done. And um, the primary group that's doing it is a Paul Seagulls group based at Stanford. And here I'm going to walk through uh, what the measurements are and then what are the models that they think that's happening at the eruption. So we have seen this uh, picture before. It's, the continuous deflation with rapid inflation during a seismic event. And on the right here is um, taking one of the uh, up peak, and then we plot out the horizontal displacement. And we can see that all the vectors, GPS and tilt are pointing outwards, which indicates inflation. So what um, the group thinks is that with the continuous uh, deflation 
is due to the continuous depressurization of the Halemama Reservoir, which is which shown really nicely on the INSA, where the, if we recall from previously, we have mapped out where Halemama Reservoir is. And can, here we can see that um, over the course of time, Halemama Reservoir is uh, deflating. And for the later part where the big zigzag motion appears, um, the group thinks is that this is due to a slip induced inflation at the Halemama Reservoir. So there's a schematic here, so I will walk everyone through slowly. So you have uh, the idea is that there's slip on this ring fault bounding the Halemama Reservoir. And then when the ring fault slips, it will uh, pressurize the reservoir and create this transient pressurization. So you have, uh, before the fault slips, you have just the deflation of the reservoir. And then when the fault slips, it creates this uh, displacement that's observed during the pressurization. So this dash mark is the displacement expected from the just the pressurization. And then because the fault is vertic vertical, so we don't expect to see any other elastic deformation. And then this is uh, from, and when the transcend pressurization is over, we can see that the displacement went back down and become constant. So there's no change from before. And we can see that in horizontal displacement, the vectors are parallel, but opposite in direction during the collapse and um, uh, during the collapse and before the collapse. But then if we change the tilt angle, so we change the dip of the fault, then it will create an elastic deformation due to the faulting behavior, and it will create a slightly different pattern on the GPS. So what we'll see here is that the dash light is just purely from the pressurization, but then we'll also see a bit of deformation from the faulting behavior itself. And then there's a permanent deformation once the pressurization is over. So the dipping of the fault uh, controls the displacement shape and pattern. So yes, you can have an inward dipping fault and you can also have outward dipping fault. And what they observe is that most of the pattern is uh, that fits, uh, how should I say that? Out, has an outward inflation stronger than the inward inflation. And this is what has been observed. So they hypothesize that the Hale Mama Reservoir is bounded by all these inward dipping faults. So for us is that we know now that the def main deforming, deforming reservoir during the eruption is the shallow Hale Mama Reservoir. So what, what does that mean? Uh, can we observe it seismically? And can we understand how does this reservoir actually deform during the eruption? So we'll next look at the first 12 events where we have the near view data. So the method that we use will be looking at moment tensor. And just like a refresher, the moment tensor is a mathematical representation of um, force couples to describe how seismic waves radiates from a point source. So it's a two by two tensor with uh, six independent components. And the moment tensor can be decomposed into uh, in several ways. We use the most common one where we can decompose into uh, the volumetric component. So this is looking at the trace where um, this explores if the source has volume change or not. So it usually occurs in examples like explosion or implosion. We also have uh, further decomposed it into deviatory components or zero trace. And within deviatory component, there can be double couple, which is our typical sort of track slip, normal fold, truss fold. We can identify the fold geometry. And then there's also um, this uh, mouthful one, this a compensated linear vector dipole, CLVD. So essentially, it could, um, the easiest way to understand is through just a few examples. So you can have a tensile crack opening or uh, closing. So you can have uh, the tensile crack closing. So there's a compression inward, but that is compensated by outward inflation in the horizontal direction. So there is, there is compression, but then there is no change in volume. 
Another way that you can have CLVD is when you have ring fold, where you have multiple shear slip along a series of fold, but then the fold is curved, so that gives an apparent CLVD. And this moment tensor has been used regularly um, and routinely to understand multiple uh, different types of earthquakes. So one of the key technique out there was global central moment tensor solution. So here I show the results of the GCMT solution for one of the caldera collapse event. And we can see that right away there is um, some challenges in trying to use GCMT solution to characterize these events. So the first one was the depth is too deep, so that 12 kilometer, and we not re recall that the reservoirs are a lot more shallower, especially if we think Hale Mama reservoir is the one deforming. And the 12 kilometer was set because anything shallower is unstable in the GCMT inversion scheme. We also have um, challenges that GCMT solution only solve for zero trace. So that means we can't understand if these sources have inflation or not. And this zero trace um, issue is well known as uh, waveforms from volumetric and vertical CLVD components are highly correlated. So this is first discussed by Kawakatsu in 1996. Here I show two examples of synthetic example for uh, a purely vertical PCLVD source and a purely positive isotropic source. And then on the here we have the ten sorry the displacement for vertical east and north component. We can see that the waveform shapes looks really similar, so it can be distinguished at long period. And even though the amplitude may have a bit of difference, but in when we do inversion, they will have been compensated by seismic moment. So this, that is not a way to identify the difference between these to uh, displacement. So that's one of the main issues with long period to try to understand um, non-double couple sources like this. Another problem uh, arises when we have very shallow source depth. So what happened is that there's zero traction at the free surface. So all the Z components are weakly excited. So that particularly affects the deep slit component. So this is another figure showing uh, synthetics from five different types of pure sources. So you have pure CLVD, strike slip components, and deep slip components. And um, we can see that these three, uh, the first three component, uh, first three type of sources has very strong signal, but then deep slip components, even with the same moment, is very weakly excited. Therefore, it's not observed at long period. And this matters when we try to understand was the deep angle of the fault, for example. And previously, uh, before I mention, if I forget, so this is important for us to distinguish between whether it's like a ring fault mechanism or if there's inflation in the volcanic set, volcanic eruption. So apart from this uh, sort of uh, limitation uh, using teleseismic waves, there's also certain challenges when it comes to volcanic settings with very complicated velocity model. So what uh, we do chose to do is to use a generalized cut and paste method in our moment tensor inversion. So what this method is uh, first developed by Liang Shijiao in 1994 and, for the, uh, and then generalized by Lu Peizhu in 2013. But what this method does is that it allows very small independent time shift when we do cross correlation on the three, comp uh, the three components, so tangential, radial, and vertical. And the this cross-correlation is used when we're trying to compare synthetic uh, from our best moment tensor to the data, and then we're trying to minimize the misfit. So allowing this uh, time shift, we can minimize effects of like imperfect velocity models. We can minimize effects from inaccurate event location and origin time and also potentially anisotropy, which can arise in volcanic settings where there's a lot of decks and seals. But then with all this, uh, what we learned from this study is that the most important thing to really constrain moment tensor for a very shallow source to have is to have the focus sphere sufficiently covered. So we have um, 
the lower hemisphere, which is like the typical that we usually see, is um, usually sampled by far field data. But then um, in, for very shallow sources, we realize we need very near field data to gain the upper hemisphere perspective and to have a better constraint. So here's the example. So we've seen a GCMT solution from before. And um, the GCMT solution is derived um, with far field data. And we can see that it also fits the regional stations around the island uh, very well. So these are stations um, not at the summit. And then these are the three different components. We have a vertical, radial, and tangential. Black is the data, red is the synthetic. We can see that because they're both far field, they, far field in the far field regime, the uh, GCMT solution fit this event uh, waveforms well. But then when we look at the GCMT solution to uh, fit to the summit station, we see that um, they don't fit um, they only fit some stations well, but not for most of the station. So these stations, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, about 10 stations covering with a very good azimuth coverage and we realize that it's, um, they are not performing as well. Similarly, if we have our own deviatoric, uh, we derive our own deviatoric solution using GCAP, we can find that uh, it fits the gen, uh, regional stations but then not the near field stations. So some stations are better fit, but not um, the majority of them. But if we consider full moment tensor, so this is when we consider isotropic component, we see that the near field summit station uh, fit very well. So that means in order to explain this waveform, we need volumetric component. So we do that for all the first 12 events where we have the near field data. And can um, here I show sort of the co different contribution of isotropic in blue, double couple in yellow, and very minimal CLVD. And you can see that this uh, across all 12 events, they are very consistent. So except event four and five, which because of their very long source duration, the inversion is slightly um, unstable. But then overall, we see that there's a strong isotropic contribution at 75%. There's a non-negligible double couple component with a consistent strike rate and dip so, uh, from the beach ball. You can, um, these events also have unusually long source duration for their magnitude. So these events are between magnitude 4.3 to 4.9, and their source duration is 10 to 20 seconds. And for a typical 4.3 to 4.9, we're looking at two to three seconds. And with the near field data, there's a good constraint on the source depth when we do grid search, and we can find that um, the solutions fits really uh, well between 0 0.7 and 2 kilometer, with the best depth at 0 0.9 kilometer. And this is the range where we think Hale Mau Mau Reservoir is. So overall, this is um, the is um, initial event fits um, can show inflation, which is consistent with geodetic, geodetic measurement. But then for the remaining 50 event, uh, what can we do when the near field data are clipped? So th this is a sort of a, one of the sample waveform from a summit station. So it has very long pulse, which gives the long source duration. And then you have the next 50 event where the clip, the signals are completely saturated. So we cannot use them. So this, um, what we realize is that when you don't have near field data, the, it's very hard to constrain depth, and depth has a very strong uh, influence on what the moment tensor looks like. So we need a different independent way to constrain depth, and that's where infrasound comes in. So we use a particular infrasound sensor that's located four kilometers away from the summit because that records the entire collapse sequence. And um, this infrasound uh, looks like um, so infrasounds are pressure wave under 20 hertz, and it has a unit of uh, pressure, so it's a Pascal. And in the observ observation, we saw two types of arrivals. You have the relay pulse, which is a uh, pulse that directly travels from the seismic source towards the sensor, and it's traveling in a compressional wave speed at three kilometers per second. 
Then you have also the acoustic pulse, which is much stronger with a downswing and the up peak. And this is pulses that travels in the air. And so it travels at acoustic speed of roughly 340 meters per second. So what we find is that this infrasound data uh, is sensitive to depth. So one way to test it is to be able to simulate this infrasound for a seismic source at depth. So if this we use a technique developed by Quentin Brissot and Leo Mathieu with um, so it's a hybrid Galakin and 2D spectral element method. So what it does is that um, we have a seismic source at them, and then we use spectral element method. So that would be the SPECFEM to solve for the elastic wave propagation from the source towards the free surface. And once it reaches the free surface, we solve for the coupling and the elastic wave converts into acoustic wave. And then we solve for the Navier-Stokes equation here with the Galakin approach. So you have surface wave and then all these are different types of infrasound. You have um, PDI, the P diffracted infrasound, head infrasound and spherical waves. But um, because we're at such a um, close distance to the source of four kilometers away, we don't have to worry a lot about the atmospheric perturbation on the infrasound. And what we realize is that if we adjust the source depth, we can have different uh, contribution to, especially towards the acoustic pulse. So here is again, is the data. And with a much stronger acoustic pulse compared to the relay pulse. So if we compare the amplitude ratio, we can see that it changes with depth. So on the right here, we have four synthetics at different source depth. So we have at 10 meters are very close to the surface, 400 meter or kilometer and 2.5 kilometer. So what we see is that as you move further away from the surface, it's become harder to generate, the coupling becomes inefficient. So it's harder to generate strong acoustic pulse. So the pulse becomes smaller with time. So what we see is that in order to fit the infrasound, the source has to be shallower than one kilometer. At one kilometer, they are identical in amplitude, which is not what is observed. So with that, we know that the source has to be shallower and we use that to solve, uh, we fixed our depth in our moment tensor to solve for just a debatoric solution. So why we only chose debatoric solution is that when we compare both debatoric and the full moment tensor, they have very similar misfit and no constraint, um, um, similar misfit between these two solution. And because without the near field data, we can't constrain the volume metric component. So we opt for just to solve for the debatoric solution so that we can get information like the fold geometry. So what we can solve and then we, so for all the 50 remaining events, and we have uh, the strike, break, dip, and also the CLVD component. So what we found is that most of these events, the majority of these events are normal folding along inward dipping fold. And the CLVD component is very minimal, which means this folding behavior is unlikely to be a complete ring fold, but I just rather a uh, small shear slip along normal folds. And we also uh, note that these folds, um, this beach ball follows a certain trend. And I overlay the trends that we measured in the particle motion uh, earlier, and we see that it fits there nicely. So that means this particle, uh, this moment tensor is tracking the change in the source behavior. And we, take the best uh, fitting moment tensor just as a sanity check to see how well it fits with the infrasound synthetics. And can see that it actually fits pretty well with the relay pulse and also um, the downswing and the upswing. So that's pretty good. But um, this idea of like not complete ring fold is, um, is uh, sort of unusual. So we try to, independently verified with a new teleseismic moment tensor inversion. So, so this is a technique developed by Osamu Sadampada. So what he does is that uh, knowing that dip slip component cannot be constrained at long period, 
So he uh, rewrote a new way to decompose the moment tensor, just uh, focusing on the resolvable moment tensor component. So what it, that allows him to do is to uh, come um, constrain two things. So you can have uh, the CLVD ratio, which tells you how much of the, how, what fraction does the rainfall has slipped. So the higher the CLVD ratio, the more rainfall that slipped. And the other thing that he can identify is from the p-axis of the stretch state component. So you have the stretch state component and the p-axis, it tells you the orientation of the rainfall that slipped. So you do it for um, all the later collapse event with teleseismic uh, W phase data shown on the right here. I can get a um, focal mechanism, calculate the CLVD ratio and the strike slip component. And we I can identify that the ring fold slip um, has two possible geometries. So either the Northwest and Southeast with a very short, um, small angle. And the Northwest uh, ring fold slip is the preferred one because that matches with the our solution using local data and also with the motion of the particle mo particle motion from the accelerometer. So this um, double confirms that it is indeed this slip behavior are not complete rainfall, but just asymmetric on one side of the fold of the caldera. But then the next question is that, can we actually uh, identify the inflation, which is suggested in the geodetic data? So this is not uh, fully constrained, but we think that the infrasound data might have suggested that there is a bit of inflation. So what we see from here before is the fit of the normal folding moment tensor on the infrasound data. And sorry, and we see that there is a mis, um, mismatch here at the 30 second mark where there is slight where the pulse is slightly broader, but then the normal folding event is very symmetric. So you can never produce this broad waveform shape. But if you have an inflation source at around one kilometer to 1.5 kilometer depth, it potentially can create, um, improve the waveform shape and fix it better. But then this requires a bit more further study. So we, so, so we are still investigating this, but it just shows that it is potential. There is potential to use other techniques like infrasound to detect inflation when you don't have near field seismic data. So with that, we can, um, we sort of solve for the questions that we have initially asked, that infrasound data can be used to constrain that, and then the vectoric solution shows asymmetric slip. But so we have shown the infrasound data for the later event, but never talk about the infrasound for the initial event, which uh, is available. So the question, sort of the bonus question for us to, is that how can we use this initial infrasound data from the initial events? to help constrain the magma plumbing system. What do they tell? So just checking time. So we have the uh, infrasound data from the last uh, 50 events, at least uh, plotted out here. So, so these are all plotted with the catalog origin time. So zero um, is origin time. And then you have the expected arrival, uh, acoustic arrival sort of mark in the orange dash line. So you can see most of the main pulse, almost of the acoustic pulse arrive at the expected time. And then obviously this one stood out and we think, suspected that is because the there's a doublet event and the catalog time chose the previous event. But then when we look at the first 12 event, we see that the waveform shapes do not look anything similar to the last 50 events. Um, first of all, the pulse, is at the opposite, have an opposite polarity. So instead of downward, it's moving upward. Also the pulse do not arrive at the time where we expect the acoustic pulse to, uh, to be. So what are these pulses? And then what, how does it relate to the magma system? So with that, we sort of like go through a, um, and cattle, um, plot the out infrasound data from some of the uh, early events that has very clear peak and also from 
the earlier VLP events. And then there are three colors here indicating three um, data from three different infrasound sensors. So we have it uh, one very close to the crater at one kilometer is MPT and the AHUD at four kilometers away. And then we have ANID, which is 19 kilometers away. And we can plot them with reduced time. So that means we minus the time it takes for the acoustic pulse to travel from the crater towards the sensor. So what we see is that we can um, see that the VLP uh, for the early events, the pulse arrive exactly at zero mark, but then there is a move out in the arrival time of this peak with time and with uh, as the day pass. We also found that the uh, waveform shape, so, it's, so I'll take uh, this event, for example, uh, explosion at May 17B, that they have very identical waveform shape. So that means anything that is causing this delay is not due to the propagation in the air, um, but it's rather due to uh, it's a source effect. So the question is what, how, what can cause this compressional peak to delay at the source? So we find that it owes at the source, it coincides with a behavior where the lava lake is retreating. So at the early of the, before the eruption, the lava lake is at its maximum height and sometimes overflows onto the crater floor. And then as the lava lake starts to retreat, we can see that it follows the move out with the compressional peak as well. And then it's the move out um, sort of stops when the lava lake reaches the reservoir depth. And we can confidently sort of uh, measure the retreat rate of the lava lake by using laser rangefinder. So the laser rangefinder basically measures the lava lake elevation with, um, which is continuously measured with uh, this mark in black. And then at around between May 3rd and May 10th, it stops at this when because the lava lake went out of view. But then it has a constant, assuming it's constant rate, we can extrapolate and um, guesstimate that at the end of the initial event around May 26, the lava lake will have reached a depth of 1.25 kilometer. So what we think is that this infrasound compressional peak is related to the change in behavior when the lava lake retreats at the summit. So how does how do we get this compressional peak? So what we hypothesize is that um, gas is being emitted to um, from to release from the magma chamber, and then as it releases, it rises up um, along the conduit, and then as and this conduit is just like a connected path connecting the magma reservoir and the vent and can be a collection of decks and seals. But for modeling uh, simplicity, we just model it as an con empty conduit. And then when it reaches the vent, the gas expands and creates this compressional peak. And the peak travels towards the sensor at the speed of acoustic, uh, at the speed of acoustic wave. So if we write out the travel time, we can expect the total travel time it takes if we the time taken the uh, to travel within the magma in the compression of speed and uh, the time it takes to travel up this empty conduit with uh, the velocity will be the velocity of the gas rising and then with the last part is the acoustic speed with the known distance from the vent to the infrasound sensor and we can measure how fast the lava lake is retreating by um, from the rate of lava lake retreating from the laser range finder at 2.2 meter per hour, multiplied by the time elapsed between the infrasound, between each event. So we measure that for the events that we could clear, uh, um, after, that we could clearly measure and that uh, gives us a, so like a nice line. We do a regression and we can identify the can solve for the three variables. So the first one is H, which is the depth of the reservoir. So we assume that at the end of the event, the lava that has reached the reservoir depth. So we, measure, we find it to be at 1.28 kilometer, which is consistent with what we think Halamama reservoir is and also consistent with Chaolia et al's um, seismic modeling. 
we also can solve for the speed of the gas rising at 37 meter per second, which is consistent with the literature and the speed of the compressional speed of the magma, which is 326 meter per second. And this is um, in literature, there will be the speed of magma with some small fractions of bubble. So with the infrasound delay time, we can use it to give an independent constraint on depth, which is not done before. So as overall, which um, we've looked at multiple things, we have seen how these magma plumbing systems are characterized, what can we study with the seismic source, and how this late initial infrasound data shows a degassing event at the Halemama Reservoir. So as a summary, I sort of walk, um, combine everything back and walk everyone through what happened at, uh, during the 2018 Kilauea summit eruption. So initially we have um, a very full lava lake which starts to um, retreat. And then this retreat uh, deflation at the summit is due to the depressurization of the Halemama Reservoir. And this is most likely driven by the eruption at the reef downstream. And uh, as the retreat uh, begins to intensify, we can see that there's a um, potentially buried faults above the caldera that starts to weaken and fail and sporadically. And as it fails, it intrudes into the reservoir, generating this long duration volumetric signal. And this buried fault potentially is the same one, which is described by the double couple components of all this um, moment tensor. And this buried fault could also potentially trigger degassing, which is accumulating at the top of the reservoir, which produces the varying infrasound data that we see. As the rift intensifies in its eruption, it triggers um, more um, sort of creating more stress on the summit. And we find that from moment tensor is that the summit starts to experienced a large scale caldera collapse, but this caldera collapse did not collapse around the ring fault, but rather just along the northwest corner of the caldera. So this is an image of uh, before and after, and you can see that on the northwest side of the caldera, there's much larger folk scum, and this is uh, consistent with the pre prevalent extensional stress of when you have the volcano moving seaward uh, due to gravity. But uh, what we think is that during the caldera, uh, be in between each caldera collapse, we find that most of the, uh, from Shelley and Talon's um, work, they find that most of the micro seismicity is concentrated around the Southeast corner. And then these, the blue dots are the um, large caldera events that have, uh, they have uh, identified. So we think is that, um, this caldera collapse might have fell in the seesaw manner where most of the slips happens along the Northwest, but then in between the caldera collapse is compensated by this micro seismicity, seismicity on the other side of the uh, caldera. So with that, we, um, as a, this is my final slide, as a combination using seismic particle motion and infrasound, sensor, uh, infrasound analysis, we can reveal that there's inflation during the 2018, eruption, Hale Mau Mau Reservoir is inflating, and also the caldera collapse is slick uh, only on one side. And this matters as we try to move forward with modeling on uh, especially the slick behavior and that controls uh, different parameters that we expect, such as like the magma compressibility, compressibility and so on. But what we also find that is that in order to really resolve a volcanic uh, moment has a volcanic settings, we need to ensure that there is good coverage of the focal sphere. And that is in order to resolve volumetric contribution and also have a better constraint on source depth. And for Kilauea, uh, we see that that's essential. We think this is also probably important for other volcanoes out there. So we have to think ways of how to increase this coverage when other volcanoes are more inaccessible than Kilauea. So, um, yeah, obviously, there's also many other open questions on how can we, moving forward, how can we better incorporate infrasound in the moment tensor inversion? So these are a few things that we can uh, further explore. 
So with that, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thanks, Moon, for that great talk. Um, we definitely have time for some questions, so you can either use the raise hand or you can drop it in the chat if you like. A lot of clapping hands right now. And Tienza, go for it. Uh, thank you, Wenhui. Very nice talk. Um, I'm a little bit confused over the infrasound signals from the uh, early, the earlier 12 events. Um, so you said that those infrasound signals are actually related to the gas releases at the uh, vent. So does that mean that they are not generated by the 12 events? So um, the way I understand is that does the infra is the infrasound data from the degassing or is it from the inflation? So we did synthetics for the inflation data and we realized the amplitude for the inflation on infrasound is very small. But then the one that we observe is a lot bigger and is as comparable with the collapse event. So we think the infrasound data should primarily be with the degassing. Also, okay. if it's purely purely from inflation, then we will expect the pulse arrive at constant time, which is mm -hmm. not the case. Oh, I see. So you, in another word, you didn't see the signals from the seismic events on the, uh, the early 12 events on the infrasound records. If or, we do see, it's, it's very weak compared okay. to the collapse events. It's, it's, it's overwhelmed by the degassing signal, in another word. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Other questions for Vu? Vu, I have a question. You said you modeled it, your volcano conduit as just like a simple conduit, but that it could be sills and dikes sort of interconnected. Um, obviously that modeling is way more complicated, but do you think that would like significantly change like how fast the like acoustics are arriving and stuff like that? Or do you think it would still be pretty consistent? I think that would, so that would trade off with the length of the conduit and the velocity. So uh, there's two types of velocity we're looking at, right? So the acoustic, three types actually. So acoustic speed, that's uh, fairly well constrained. So it's either the speed of the compressional wave or the speed of the gas rising. And we think that only the gas rising speed is the one that matters because, the order, because of the order of magnitude. So you could have, let's say a much, short, um, if there are lots of ducks and seals, so you potentially just increase the length and then you can have a slightly faster gas rising speed. So I think those two trade off. So you think your like depth uh, measurement would, is pretty consistent, but the speed of the arrival think, would change. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Peter, do you want to ask your question or would you like me to read it? Uh, yeah, let me. Um, unmute here. So I was wondering, um, you showed a lot of examples of uh, uh, geophysics, you know, from the seismometers to um, of the accelerometers to um, the NSAR um, and uh, the infrasound. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's any, uh, I mean, if there's anything that's um, uh, um, 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 missing. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the geophysical instrumentation that that would have helped a lot? Uh, I think, I'm, uh, this, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, because there's actually already a lot of geophysical, geophysical instruments on Kilauea volcano, perhaps gravity, but then that would, I think that would not solve the dynamic part of the eruption, but rather just to have a better constraint of uh, where the Halemama Reservoir is, which I think is already been done for Kilauea. So I think maybe like, um, perhaps like a borehole seismometer might be interesting. So you can have much better constraint on the micro seismicities and also the depth. And I don't think, I don't right. think I have an example of a borehole seismometer on the volcanic setting. So hmm. that'll be just interesting to see how it looks like. Okay, thank you.
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, so I have uh, a few questions related to the uh, last 50 uh, events. Uh, you mentioned yeah. from the infrasound, it seems like there are a very shallower depth. Uh, but if I remember correct, so they are also like magnitude larger than five, uh, 4.5 events. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, carry on. Yeah, so I'm wondering like, uh, is there like, will there be like surface fracture related to those uh, events because they are really shallow and also um, not very small events? Okay, so I think I realized this, I did not make it clear in the talk is that for the collapse events, the average magnitude is 5.2 to 5.3. So that's probably what you're referring to. Oh, okay. And then we set the, so we, we're representing these events with moment tensor, right? So we, with a 5.3 event, we think the rupture length is about one kilometer. So we put it, we put the central depth at 450, just as a, as a central depth. So it could have rupture all the way to the surface and causes a sort of like a constant displacement. But uh, which, um, that would require a different way of describing the moment tensor, but we, didn't, uh, we chose not to use that approach. Okay. And uh, also for the uh, GCAP method, uh, you try to simulate the waveform. I'm wondering what is the, the phase? Uh, is it a P or S wave you are fitting or surface wave? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, they are all surface wave. Surface, okay. Look, yeah, at, um, between 10 to... I can't remember, it's 33 seconds, I think. Okay, thank you. Yuri, go for it. Uh, yes, I'm wondering if uh, larger events like magnitude fours and fives are all coming from the same place or do they um, collectively um, cir circumscribe the entire caldera boundary? So for the later 50 events, we think that it's just multiple um, shear slip sort of zipping along the northwest side of the caldera. So what about at the least south? that's the so the southeast might have slip as well, but then the main radiating part of the seismic source is from the northwest. So seismically, you're not seeing much of the moment release from the southeast. Uh, that that would be accurate. Yeah. Okay. And so in order for the entire caldera roof or top to subside, there, there has to be some motion on that fault on the southeast, right? And I'm yeah. presuming that all the micro seismicity is not releasing enough, enough moment to uh, accommodate it seismically. So is the implication there that at the southeast, the slip on these, on these buried faults or perhaps faults that propagate all the way to the surface is primarily a seismic? Is that the conclusion there? So I can't tell for sure for the southeast side, but then either it's uh, a seismically slipping or it was accommodated sm slowly with the small micro seismicity. Okay. But then is, what we is, can conclude just from the observation, seismic observation is that during the big peaks, the main radiating seismic source is all on the northwest side. Okay. Is there anything in the GPS data that would suggest that there is some significant motion there? that is not just explained by seismic activity at the north. So, so GPSs, I think from Paul Seeger's uh, modeling, they try to model as rainfall, but then they can never quite, uh, they realize there's an asymmetry in the GPS measurement. So, so it has not been done yet, but we think if you actually consider most of the slip on Northwest, that will have fit a bit better. But then I think, um, what is it? The, there's no GPS stations directly at the southeast side of the caldera it's or outside of the caldera, so it's a bit hard to tell. And then with, I think there are groups that use a sort of like DM measurements and take repeating pictures, but then there's also in between time, so we can't see during the dynamic part of the inflation if the southeast part is slipping. It could have, but I think most of it will be on the northwest. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Vim?
with that, um, let's thank Boone one more time for her lovely talk. And next week, we're going to have our very own Jin Hua give a seminar. So hope to see everyone uh, next Tuesday. Thanks again, Boone. See you all next week. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, guys.